I can still hear him going on and saying, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, and so on. See, this was at soccer practice, and we had apparently just played an abysmal, disjointed, horrible game of soccer the previous Saturday. And Coach Wyrick, he decided that what we needed as a team, more than passing drills, more than shooting drills, more than running or conditioning, was a discussion about what it means to actually be a team, to work together for this common goal. That it means that different people were gonna have different roles on this team. You can't all try to be forwards and run up at the same time and score a goal because then no one's going to be left on defense. And you can't all sit back and defend because then no one's going to go up there and try to score a goal. And he went on, being on a team means that you have a coach. And the coach is going to organize you in the way that best suits the team's needs with everyone's individual skills and talents. And our job was to trust that the coach knows what he's doing, and then to do our best with whatever position he's put us in. And so Coach Wire read to us from this passage about the church that we find in 1 Corinthians. Now what's, what's great about this passage about the church here is sometimes the language that scripture uses when it talks about the church, it can be really abstract. Uh, last week we talked about the, the church as, as God's workmanship and, and how that was really an artistic word. So the, the church is really kind of like a work of art that God is working on. That's a pretty abstract concept. But here, Paul's illustration, it's immensely practical, isn't it? There are applications for what he says here uh, for just about any type of organization you can think of. A business, a social club, various ministries, even you've been trying to help a bunch of middle school boys learn how to play a sport better. Wow, what a boy. But I don't want that practical aspect to fool us. This, this practical advice that Paul is giving about organizations, it comes as part of this very deep, long, important discussion he's having with this Corinthian church about what it means to actually be a people who belong to Christ to come together to worship and minister in his name. You see, the church that Paul was writing to, this church at Corinth, the city of Corinth, well, in many ways, it was a completely dysfunctional church. It was a church in disarray. There were all these cliques that had formed. There were these cases of profound immorality going on. There was this divisive arrogance that had started to, to come up. And there was really bad theology. All of these things were going on in this community. So really, if you think about it, Coach Wyrick was on to something because that's probably not much different than a group of middle school boys. And let me just say as a kind of aside here before we get more into this passage, I love the fact that there are all these troubles that we read about in these early, early churches. I find it incredibly hopeful because what it says is that there is nothing that we are going to deal with in the church now that hasn't happened and been dealt with before, even when we go back to these early New Testament churches. The surface problems that we see maybe today, they, they may change, but the underlying issues, they're nothing new. There's nothing that God has not dealt with and that God is not already aware of. So I think that's worth remembering and noting that through the inspiration of the Spirit, Paul, he offers deep theological insight and correction and advice and instruction to these churches, but what he never does is he never assumes that these churches and these people are beyond the grace of God. Despite any of this stuff that was going on and causing trouble in the church, Jesus, Paul would say, Jesus is still Lord in Corinth just as he is still Lord in our churches today. Which is why I suspect that Coach Wyrick knew that, well, if there was hope for this Corinthian church, then there was probably hope for a middle school soccer team as well. And among the many problems that were going on in this ancient church, one of them was this view that some people within the church were, were more spiritual 
and better Christians simply because they had these certain gifts that others did not have. In this particular church, it was, it was things like speaking in tongues and these more kind of ecstatic religious experiences. Of course, in any given church, it might be any number of things that, that seem to elevate or that we want to elevate above others. Someone good at public speaking or praying eloquently out loud or whatever it is that we tend to idolize in our churches. So anyway, this view crept in that these type of gifts, these types of gifts, they were, they were better or more spiritual than other gifts. And so if you had one of these gifts, well then that obviously meant that you were better and you were more spiritual and you were more important to the church than anybody else. And so what Paul does as he is he's correcting them on this, on this view, on these ideas, what he does is he draws on the image of a body. Now, this would not have been unusual to these first readers of this letter. The ancient Greeks, they used the image of the body for illustrating the way societies and, um, and the way political organizations and families and, and other types of groups, they used the image of the body all the time to talk about how they should work and function. This was a common illustration of the day. But the way that Paul uses this image would have been surprising and unusual to them. You see, the, the typical Greek thought was that, was that some stations in life, well, they were obviously higher and better and more important than others. And so whatever station of life you were born into, well, that was just the way it was. That said things about how important you were. It meant that some people were just naturally superior to others. And so in this everyday kind of Greek thought, the image of the body was used to reinforce that notion. They would use it to say something like, well, the hands or the feet, they can never be the brain or the heart of the body. So the hands and feet just need to accept the fact that they're stuck with this less important, menial, dirty, physical work, and they're not as important as maybe the brain or the heart. Some people were seen to be more important in society and in the society's function than others. And they used the image of the body to reinforce that. But then along comes Paul, here in this 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he also uses the image of the body. But he says, he says, yes, the church is like a body. But this actually does not mean that there are more important and less important members. In fact, it means just the opposite. Every part of the body has certain gifts and talents that are all there for the common good. And without any of them, the body would not be able to function as it's supposed to. So you see what Paul's doing here. First, he's saying that if a body is to work as it's supposed to, well, it's pointless to argue about what parts are more important than others. They're all important. They're all necessary for the functioning of the body. And so what matters is not so much who has what gifts. What matters is that it's the fact that it's the same Lord that has called you all to be a part of this one body. But then Paul goes on, and he says to the Corinthians, he says, okay, but if you really want to start judging the importance of different members of this body, well, if anything, the ones that seem to be weaker and need more protection, well, they're often the ones that in the end do turn out to be the most indispensable. And likewise, any parts of the body that we tend to think of as, as less honorable, less respectful, the parts that we want to cover up, and I'll let you draw for yourself what parts he may be making with this analogy. Well, those are the parts that we end up clothing with greater honor and treating with more respect. So, Paul says to these, these Corinthians, if there's going to be a discussion about what parts may be more important or more indispensable, well, you need to be careful because they're not going to be the ones that you are likely to expect. It's not going to be the strongest. It's not going to be the most presentable or the most respectable. Why? Well, because we're not just talking about any old body or organization here. We're talking about the church. We're talking about the body of Christ. And that is how the kingdom of God works. That is how it is in Jesus Christ. The things that we tend to value, they're often not the things that God values. 
The things that we look to for security and salvation and hope and peace, well, they're often not where we will really tru and truly find those things. <clears throat> if you want hope and salvation, and peace and security, let's be honest here. Our natural inclination is not to look to some itinerant preacher who traveled around with this gang of 12 rough and tough men from, the, from some backwoods towns and who ended up being arrested and put to death by the state. That's not where we naturally would go for peace and security and hope. And yet, and yet that is precisely where God has said we will find that hope and security and salvation and peace that we are looking for. That's the way that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And so, Paul says, so it is with his church. So it is with this body of Christ. So if we want to talk about what particular member of the church is the most indispensable or important, if we want to talk about maybe who should be the face of our church, well, it may very well not be the ones that seem to have it all together or have the most impressive list of talents and gifts. And it might just be the ones that seem the less, the less presentable, the ones that seem to have things together the least. And it may even be the one who is struggling through this whole faith thing the most. In the kingdom of God, family, that person may very well be far more important than we can ever think because that may be the one that God's grace and mercy can actually shine through the most. And isn't that the purpose of the church? <clears throat> and so, because of this, because of this, Paul goes on to say, we are called to care deeply for one another no matter what. Because all of these different members of the body are designed to work together as one body for the common good of all. To the point, he says, that if one member is suffering, all should suffer with it. And if one is honored, all are honored and should rejoice with it. <clears throat> now, have you ever, have you ever gotten uh, an injury on something like your little finger or your little pinky toe? Maybe, maybe you get a paper cut or you jam your little tiny toe and it's, it's such a small area of your body, and it's a little tiny thing, but those things hurt. And it just messes with your entire day. You jam your pinky toe, I don't know about you, but my day is ruined. I'm ready to go back to bed and call it quits. <laughs> One small thing, it starts to affect your whole body. Or maybe it's something good. There are a lot of donut shops around here, I've noticed, in a few months ago. <laughs> And it reminds me, um, I hope you all are thankful for the plethora of donut shops you have, because it reminds me of when, when I was in college at Virginia Tech. It was a small town in Blacksburg, Virginia. Right off campus was the town's Main Street. And as you walk from campus to Main Street, you walk past our one donut shop. And the people that ran this donut shop, they were really smart. They were shrewd business people, because what they did was they had the exhaust vent that came up from their kitchen outside. Well, they, they, they made it so the exhaust vent actually came out right above the front door, right at the sidewalk. And so you'd be walking into town to run some errands or, or do something like that. You'd be walking along the sidewalk, and suddenly you would walk into this pocket of warm air that smelled like really good, fresh donuts. So whatever you were up to that day, you would find yourself, you'd suddenly stop and take a little detour inside the shop. And it didn't matter what kind of day you were having, you would, you would pick up that fresh donut, you would take a bite, and all those little taste buds on your tongue, they would start to rejoice. And when you did that, the rest of your body rejoiced with them. One small thing can cause your whole body to rejoice. Now granted, that is a, well that's a really stupid example <laughs> of something that is actually one of the most profound and hardest things that we as the church, as the body of Christ, are called to do and to be. That not only are all of us given certain and different gifts and personalities and life experiences for the purpose of coming together, for 
for the common good of the church. Not only are we to be united in that way, but also God calls us to be so united that when one of us is suffering or mourning or anything like that, all of us suffer and mourn alongside of them. And likewise, when one of us rejoices or has something to celebrate, all of us are called to celebrate and rejoice with them. That's why I love the fact that sharing concerns and prayer requests and thanksgivings and joys are a part of our regular worship service. We're going to do it here, do that very thing here in a few minutes. Because it does matter. It's part of becoming the body that God calls us to be. See, Paul's not just talking about having sympathy for one another. He's talking about having empathy with each other. Do you know the difference? Sympathy is when we feel for someone, we feel sorry for someone, or we feel happy for someone. But empathy is deeper than that. Empathy is actually we enter into what that other person is experiencing the best we can. Let me give you just one, um, one practical thought about how this works. And um, this, is, this is one that, that's difficult. But here's one way that this can play out kind of as we live in the cultural and the political and social climate that we currently live in. Last week, we had our first responders recognition Sunday. I was chatting briefly at the picnic that we had after, after the service. I was chatting with uh, one of the police officers who had come. And this officer said to me how nice it was to have people show care and concern for them as the police. That right now, so much of what we hear on the news and kind of the, the words that we hear spoken and things like that, there's a lot of angry condemnation of the police because of the actions of, of just a few. And how, how they were feeling like people are not, not able to take the time and just even consider and empathize with them what their job is like. How hard it is to do and what they go through on a daily basis. By the same token, in kind of the same conversation that our society is having, having, there are a lot of voices in the African American communities that are also saying that there are deep and systemic problems still in our society around the issue of race. And whenever these issues of society and race come up, there's always an inclination um, for many to kind of to discount what's being said. Now this is not an easy issue for us to wrestle with, and I'm going to limit this to talking about the church, though there are probably broader social implications here. When we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are saying, whether it's the law enforcement community or the African American community or any group of people, when we have brothers and sisters that are saying and telling us about things they are experiencing that cause deep pain or struggle, whatever it is, our job as members of that same body of Christ is to listen. Not so we can immediately decide whether what they are saying and feeling is valid or not, but it's to listen and hear what they are saying as a brother or a sister in Christ so that we can, as best we can, enter into their pain or their frustration or hurt or whatever it is alongside of them. We're usually pretty good at doing this when others are rejoicing and celebrating because that's fun and exciting. But what Paul is also saying here is that when anyone who is a brother or sister is hurting, for whatever reason, we need to first listen and pray that the Spirit would give us ears to hear what they are saying, and that the Spirit would give us hearts to enter into it with them. If we are not doing that, if we are rushing to divide up into sides or something like that, then quite frankly, we are not living into our calling to be the body of Christ. But here's the thing. This isn't just good, practical advice for running an efficient organization. This attitude toward the church as a body, this is the lifeblood of the church. Because this is exactly 
what Christ did and does for us. Jesus enters into our life, life experiences. He enters into our joys and our sorrows alongside of us and with us. And ultimately, it was because Jesus entered into this human life that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that He came to empathize and share in and participate in this life with us. On the cross, Jesus entered into even our worst moments, into those places of deepest guilt, or pain, or sorrow, or sin, or whatever they are. And it was precisely because Christ did this that he was able to bring salvation and redemption and call us together to be the church. And so as the church, as this body of Christ, we are called to do the same, to be people who enter into life with each other and for each other, that we might be agents of his, proclaiming his salvation and his redemption. Family, that is what it means to be the church. That is what it means to be the body of Christ, to work as one for this one common goal, to share and reflect and proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ. That is what it means to be the body of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now as your people, but as a people who well, don't often or don't always work together as we should. And so we pray that you would give us a greater sense this morning of what it means to be the body of Christ. Lord, that as your body, we, can, we will reflect and proclaim to the world nothing short of your grace and your mercy and your reconciling love for us. Lord, that all, all might be called into this same fellowship. This one church, the body of Christ. Amen.